That's nice. I have my own Bible. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. It's just in case. It's just in case? I, I actually need that one. Okay, I'll need good. It, yeah. Keep it. Water for me and everything. Fabulous. Well, this morning at our church, uh, we kind of had a creation theme going. And uh, so I decided to speak about a very important and critical thing today that's really threatening our whole planet, global warming. <laughs> How many of you are feeling it? Yeah. <laughs> right? Just kidding, just kidding. Really what I want to speak to you about tonight, the title of my, uh, what I want to share with you tonight is Disciples who obey everything that Jesus commanded. Sounds like a good idea, right? So I invite you to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 28. We're going to read verses 16 through 20 as a scripture reading. And we're going to see what God has to say to us tonight. I thank you for inviting me to come share with you this evening. Uh, I count it a great privilege and an honor to, to speak to this group of people tonight. And uh, even more important than you, it is my great honor and privilege to serve Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and uh, to be called by him into his service. And uh, it is just my honor and privilege to be able to serve Jesus in life and to bring the word before you this evening. Amen. And so Matthew chapter 28, I'm going to read verses 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What I just read for you here this evening is what I would classify as God's plan A to save the world. And how many people know that there is no plan B? Okay? There is no plan B. This is God's plan A to save the world. So this evening, really, what I'd like to share with you is going to be in three segments tonight. Okay? I'm going to start off with good news. How many people want to hear some good news? Amen. Okay. But then I'm going to share some bad news. I know. I have to do it because there's bad news. But then I'm going to finish up with good news. Exactly. You got it. You were able to, that was prophetic right there. You knew it. Right? So we're going to have good news and bad news and then more good news. So here's the good news that we start off with. Plan A, God's great commission, is working all over the world. Do you realize that when you talk about, like what Pastor Jesse shared about Nigeria, and you would think that because Christians are under such persecution there, that it would be causing the church to, to just go away and vaporize. You realize that exactly the opposite is happening? <coughs> that in Africa, Africa is becoming a Christian continent. Amen. In places like Asia, in China, the church is growing by something ridiculous like 50,000 people a day. All over the world, this great commission, this plan A of God is working in miraculous ways, and people are coming to faith in Christ by the millions. God's plan A is working so well. But then I have some bad news. Not here. The bad news is, there is one place in the world that plan A just doesn't seem to be working so well. Hmm. Take a guess as to where that place might be. I know. Right here. Right here. The United States yep. of America. For some reason, plan A doesn't seem to be working here. 
And so we could ask the question, why? Why, if this God's great plan A is working all over the world and people are coming to faith in Christ all over the place, even though they're facing great persecution, and it's working everywhere else, but it's not working here in America, why? Well, here would be my answer that I believe the scriptures point out. I would say the reason why it's not working is in America is because of what I would classify as the great disobedience to the great command to go and make disciples of Jesus. Did you notice how, in what I just read in the scripture, that verses 19 and 20 are really just one sentence? Right? And all these things go together. Let me go back there, right? And we know these scriptures from hearing them in church all the time. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Right? So, like, there's the Great Commission. But then notice the very next verse says, And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. To obey everything I've commanded you. And you know, there's lots of things when we look at all the various commands that are given in Scripture and given by Jesus. And you know, we do okay at keeping some of the commands and then other commands we're not so good at. But you would think if there was one command that we would definitely keep, it's the one command that's in the very same sentence as, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And that one command is, go and make disciples. But for some reason, in our country, there has been a great disobedience to this great command. So tonight, I would just invite you to just bear with me as I share some more scriptures with us tonight. And I would just ask you to examine yourselves honestly and humbly and ask, how are we doing with this great commission of Jesus for ourselves in each of our individual lives? Because you realize it's not just a command to pastors. Does everybody know that? Amen. It's not just a... Is that... This is dying. That's dying? Okay. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. One thing else in the world is not working, that microphone. <laughs> so I'd like you just to examine yourselves honestly and, and just search your own heart to see if... Uh, you are in obedience to this great command of Jesus. And then maybe what we need to do in order for this thing to turn around is for us as the body of Christ, us as the church in America, would be to repent and recommit ourselves to boldly sharing the gospel and making new disciples. If you want to turn with me to the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 7, there's an interesting verse there that I think describes the scene that we are living in today. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, say this. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. When you look at that phrase there, wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. Has anybody else noticed that our country is going to hell? <laughs> yes. Think about what that verse is saying. Wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. Folks all around us, in our community, in our culture, are people who are headed for destruction. Amen. Amen. There is darkness all around us. It's been evident as we've battled in our community over this recent thing in Bloomsburg, as you're all aware of, that Pastor Jesse referred to, and in so many other areas. Our country is imploding in destruction. Why? I would say because people are not Christians. Why are they not Christians? because there's been a great disobedience to the great command of Jesus. We need to point out this narrow road that leads to life. Amen. And if we don't point that narrow road out, nobody else will. The only thing that will rescue many of our friends and family and neighbors 
that are right now on this road to destruction is obedient disciples sharing the good news of the gospel. We must pray for the compassion of Jesus to fill our hearts with a burden for the lost. Look at Matthew chapter 9 and verses 35 to 38. Here we see a good description of the kind of attitude of heart that we need to have. We need to be like Jesus. Look at what Jesus did. Jesus went all through the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom. There's the sharing of the gospel, right? Preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he said, what a bunch of losers. I'm going to ignore them. Is that what he said? Not exactly, right? When he saw the crowds, it says he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless. Anybody you know that fits into that category? Harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. We're surrounded by them. We need to reach those people. Notice how Jesus talks about how this is going to happen. Verse 37, then he said to his disciples... And I think we're supposed to be disciples, right? Is that that great commission thing? Yeah. Make disciples. Anybody here a disciple tonight? Amen. Okay. So he said to the disciples, and that's some of you, the harvest is plentiful. See, the good news, plan A is still working. Right? The harvest is plentiful. But there's a problem. This is the bad news. But the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Now, you notice there's some different characters in the story, right? One of the characters is who I would classify as Farmer Jesus. Okay? Because he's giving an analogy here about the harvest and a farm and this kind of thing. So, in this analogy here, like Jesus, he's the farmer. And he's got a big farm. And the harvest is ripe right now. The harvest is plentiful. And he's got workers. That's not the problem. There's workers. There's people who say, oh, I love Jesus. I want into his kingdom. I want to be a worker. But where's the workers? He's talking about the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So we see farmer Jesus. And in the context of the story, we see there's supposed to be harvest workers. But then there's another category of people that I have to add in here that I think fit into the church in America. And I would call them barn dwellers. Yep. Mm-hmm. Barn. Farmer Jesus, harvest workers, yep. and barn dwellers. Yes. Because what I see in the church in America is there's a lot of people that like the salvation that Jesus has to offer. Amen. They like the idea of going to heaven someday and not burning in hell. They like that message and they say, oh, Jesus, I want to give my life to you because I want to be saved and I want my sins to be forgiven but they're not as willing to go back out into the harvest field to bring other people to that message. They want to hang out in the barn. Oh, I just love church. Church is so awesome. I love to praise the Lord and to worship and to hear the word of God, and I'm just going to hang out in the barn. But Farmer Jesus is saying, hey, workers, the crops are out in the field. I mean, it's nice to come to the barn once in a while, spend like, you know, a couple hours on a Sunday morning in the barn for a meeting, worship the Lord together. It's great to have a barn meeting. All right. But workers, when the barn meeting is over, there's a harvest out there, Amen. and I want you to get to work. Amen. You get the point here, right? <clears throat> you see, after the barn meeting is over, God wants us to get to work in the fields, or else the farmer may fire you. I don't know. (laughs) You see, the harvest is ripe right now. People all around us are desperate to find the hope that only Jesus can give them. I want to read you a verse from John chapter 4. This is verses 30 and 35, 35 and 36 from the New Living Translation. I want you to get a picture of this harvest that Jesus is talking about. And it's people. Right, here's what it says, John 4, 35, 36. Jesus said, you know the saying, four months between planting and harvest? But I say, wake up! Anybody sleeping out there tonight? (laughs) 
Wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvester paid good wages. And notice, listen to the very next words. The fruit they harvest is what? People. People. Are you sure it's not corn? <laughs> Green beans. No. Jesus is talking about the harvest is fruit. People brought to eternal life. Notice the last phrase there. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. You see, our prayer should be, Lord, I want the joy of bringing people to eternal life. I want to get out into that harvest field and work. Turn also to Matthew chapter 13. Here we see a picture, I think, of the fruitful life that Jesus is talking about there. Because we see the fruit that Jesus is after, this harvest, is people that he wants to bring to eternal life. And I think we see a picture of that in the scriptures in Matthew chapter 13. It's a picture of a fruitful disciple who I would say obeys everything Jesus commanded, especially his command to make disciples. We see it right there in verse 23, first of all. Matthew 13, 23. This is, is I believe, a good picture of this fruitful disciple. It says, but the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word of God and understands it. So this guy went to church, got the message, got saved, and he's a good church member. But it didn't stop there. He remembered that there's a time to get out of the barn and get to work in the field. And when he went to work in the field, this is what happened to this faithful disciple. He found the fruit and he harvested it. It says in the last part of verse 23, he produced a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Now, brothers and sisters, I think this is a picture of what God wants from each and every believer in Jesus Christ as a description of their life. Because I believe that if we were faithful disciples of Jesus who obey everything that Jesus commanded, especially his command to go and make disciples, then we can expect in the normal course of our lifetime that we should be able to lead 30 or 60 or maybe even 100 people Amen. to faith in Christ. That's the picture of a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. So let me ask you a question. In light of that picture, how are we doing? How are we doing? I have to say, as I examine my own heart and in my own life and my own ministry, I mean, for heaven's sakes, I'm a pastor of a church. I'm not sure how many people I could put on a list as disciples that I've led personally to faith in Christ. I'm not sure if I have 30 people yet. So I'm still working on this. Maybe you are too. But the good news is, God will bless and give us the harvest and lead many people to faith in Christ if we'll only go out and faithfully into the harvest field and share the gospel. My prayer is that each and every one of us, that the church in America will rise up and wake up to get back out into the harvest field so that each and every one of us could see 30 or 60 or even 100 times what was sown into our own lives. I thank God for the people that led me to faith in Christ. And I want to reproduce that same faith in many other people. But, you know, there's also a problem pointed out in this passage. Because we see that good soil grows many disciples. But I would have to say that the church in America has become invaded by thorns. Back up just one verse in Matthew 13, verse 22. And we can see an example of people who are not faithful disciples of Jesus. Just one example in this passage. It says, The one who received the seed that fell among thorns is the man who hears the word. He went to church, listening to the word. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. Brothers and sisters, there's lots of thorns. Thorns all over the place. The worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, choking out the life of the church 
and the purposes of God. So many things. Oh, Pastor, you don't understand. I'm busy. I got stuff to do. Well, remember that Great Commission thing? Sure. And obeying everything that Jesus commands? That's some of the stuff that we have to do. But maybe we're too distracted by the worries of this life. What's the latest program on TV? Or whatever. The deceitfulness of wealth. Choking out God's purpose to make us into fruitful disciples of Jesus. So what will it take to overcome this thorny deception that has overgrown the true church as it was intended to be? Turn to John chapter 12. Here we see, I think, a good description of what the answer would be. John chapter 12, verses 23 and 25 Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And here he's using another analogy about his own life. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. Do you realize that's what Jesus did too? Amen. He knew what his mission in life was. It was to die on the cross of Calvary. Why? Does it sound like a fun thing? It was because he knew that by his death, multitudes of people would be saved. You realize he wants the same attitude in us? He was willing to die. He wants us to be willing to die for the same gospel that he came to share. So verse 24, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But thank the Lord that Jesus did not remain a single seed. He's now been multiplied into multitudes of people of faith. It says, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. That's the good news that's taking over the planet. The gospel of Jesus Christ is producing many seeds. Multitudes of people are coming to faith and being saved. But notice in verse 25, it talks about we have some options here when it comes to following Jesus. Because now we're going to talk about us. We see that Jesus set the example, but let's talk about us. Verse 25, the man who loves his life. Well, I love my life. That sounds like a good idea. I think life is good. I'm not feeling suicidal or anything like that. Right? Life is good. What's he talking about here? I think he's talking about loving life consumed selfishly. The man who loves his life will lose it. Loves his life not given to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Loves his life not given to fulfill the calling of the Great Commission. Because we love it to do a lot of other stuff with it. But not to complete and be in obedience to the great command of Jesus. But it's not good news, is it, for that man? Because the man who selfishly loves his life is going to lose it. But notice what happens to this other man in verse 25, right? It says, while the man who hates his life in this world, do you notice that? Who hates his life in this world. It's the one who says, I don't have time to watch television because I've got a great mission to fulfill. The great mission of Jesus. That man is willing to hate his life in this world so that he might keep it for eternal life. And not just for himself, but for the 30, 60, or 100 people that he can lead to faith in Christ personally. You see, that's Jesus' great commission. Turn to Mark chapter 8. <clears throat> Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 38, Jesus talks about something very similar. <clears throat> Verse 34 says, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must go to them all. Is that what it says? No. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. All that thorny stuff that we seem to like so much. He must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You mean the cross wasn't just for Jesus? No. 
It was for us too. That means a life of total self-sacrifice. You're not here for you. You're here for the next one to get saved. Deny himself and take his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life for himself will lose it. In the end, you lose and everyone else loses. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel, oh, that great command thing you're talking about? Yeah, that's the one. The man who loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it if a man would gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. And brothers and sisters, we are living in an adulterous and sinful generation. But Jesus calls us not to be ashamed of his gospel. Not to be ashamed of this message of good news that will save people from an eternity in hell. But if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, there is some really bad news. And we don't want this to be true for any one of us. The Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. May God spare us from that faith. Have anybody here ever heard of this story about this thing called the Titanic? Anybody ever heard that story about the Titanic? Okay. You know, the big boat, they made that big boat. It, it was something like, I think it was unsinkable. Do you know the story? Yeah. Hello? Yes. Okay. The unsinkable Titanic. So it sets uh, sail on its maiden voyage, and there's thousands of people on this boat. And wouldn't you know it, this boat that they say can't sink, it has a little problem. It hits an iceberg. You, you know the story, right? It's the iceberg. And what happens to the, to the boat, the Titanic? It goes down, right? It goes down into the icy waters. And because it was an unsinkable ship, okay, when, the people, when they were building the ship, you know, there's lifeboats always on a ship. Uh, but because the Titanic was unsinkable, and even though it could hold thousands of people, there wasn't enough lifeboats for every person on the boat. You know that? Mm -hmm. But there were still quite a few. I mean, there was hundreds and hundreds of lifeboats on the Titanic. And as the Titanic was going down into the icy waters of the ocean, all those lifeboats started going out into the water. But not everybody made it onto a lifeboat. You realize that there were several people who were still in the water and several people who did not get into the lifeboat right away, but they just ended up in the icy waters. Do you realize that uh, out of all the people who were saved in the lifeboats of the Titanic, according to the story, they said there could have been a whole lot more people that could have been saved because there was plenty of room on the lifeboats. Most of the lifeboats were only like half full of people. Some of them just had a few people on the lifeboat, and there was enough room for about 20 or 30 people on every lifeboat. But some of them just had maybe half a dozen out of all the lifeboats. Do you know what the problem was of why those boats, a lot of them, those lifeboats were half empty? And why not as many people were saved that were out in the icy waters? Do you know why? Here's why. Listen carefully is because those who were already saved in the lifeboats mm. didn't turn them back around to go back out to get those who were not yet saved. Mm. That's why not as many were saved. Those who were already saved did not turn the lifeboats around to go get those who were not yet saved. Brothers and sisters, Cruise line of Christianity in America has hit an iceberg. It's going down. God wants us off the cruise and in the lifeboats seeking the lost to save as many as possible. We must listen to their screams, begging to be saved because they're there all around us. 
How many people want some good news? Here's the good news. The great command of Jesus to go and make disciples still works. Mm -hmm. If we will repent of our great disobedience and recommit ourselves to boldly proclaim the gospel. But we need power. I think we might be able to find some power. Turn to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And I want to show you where the power is going to come from for us to take this good news of Jesus Christ and turn this thing around. A way for us to turn our lifeboats around, to go back out and find those who are not yet saved so that they might be saved. Brothers and sisters, we need power. But power is available. We can do this by Christ's authority. Because when he went back to heaven, he sent Holy Spirit power to all Christians who will walk in obedience to his great mission. Here it is in verse 8. You will receive power. Hello? Amen. Should have been at least a couple Amen. of amens for that. Amen. You will receive power. Power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. What's the power for, folks? What's the next words? And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, even including Berwick and Bloomsburg and Danville and even Little Nescapec. Okay? Holy Spirit power is available to us. But we could ask the question, why does it seem like the church in America is so powerless? Did the Holy Spirit die? I don't think so. Holy Spirit power is available according to the word of God that I read. But maybe Christians just are not finding the Holy Spirit. I don't know what they're doing. But we have the power available. The Holy Spirit dwells within us if we'll live the victorious Christian life. And His power will give us the power to be His witnesses. So how can we help each other to get that power? It says a little bit later on in verse 14, right? Talking about the same group of people. Where did they get the power? According to verse 14, it says they all join together constantly in prayer. Well, we all know that the prayer meeting of the church is the best attended service out of all week, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. Not. What planet do you live on, Pastor Mike? Yeah, right. Right. Maybe that's the problem, huh? All right, go ahead. Bring they all join together constantly in prayer. Folks, only spirit-filled prayer in the church will take us to the place of miracles once again to the completion of this great mission of Jesus. Wow. But guess what? God's not done doing miracles. It started in the book of Acts, but it's still going on today. Right. If we'll only walk in obedience. Amen. Turn to Acts chapter 2, verses 42 and 43. We see what the church there did. It's our job still today. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and they had a good time in church. <laughs> not. Well, not exactly. And many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. You think God's doing that kind of stuff today? God still wants to do miracles today. Come on, help me out here. If we'll pray like the early church prayed, all right. I believe we also can see thousands come to faith in Christ. Just back up a couple of verses in that passage. Go back to verses 40 to 41. And this is where we need to be today still. Peter is saying, with many other words, he warned them. And he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. I wish we could put that on the television. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, right? Save yourselves. From this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized. 
and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Well, brothers and sisters, tonight I pray that the Holy Spirit power will fill this group of people here tonight so that by this time next year there are 3,000 new souls added to the churches of one church, one voice. Amen. Do you Amen. think that can happen? Amen. Can God still do that miracle? Amen. Or is he done with miracles? We just need his Holy Spirit power and our commitment to walk in obedience. So I have a question for us tonight. Is there anyone else out there tonight that has the same heart for this great mission of Jesus that I've been talking about tonight? Is there anybody else out there Amen. who has a heart to see this mission of Jesus completed? Yes. And are you willing to make a commitment to see that happen? We have. We have. I, okay, I think I heard six people. Amen. Anybody else? Yes. Anybody willing to make a commitment? In with your bulletin here tonight, there was a little paper. It's a little practical tool. If you want to take seriously what I'm talking about tonight, I don't want you to just get a warm fuzzy. All right. I want you to do something about it. So I'm going to give you a practical way that you can make a commitment to live out a desire to live in obedience to the great command of Jesus. Uh, we talked about this at my church last week. The idea of your house becoming a lighthouse. You notice on the front half of the paper there, you have a place for your name. Everybody know your name? Yes. Okay, who doesn't know their name? <laughs> Raise your hand. Justin, your name is Justin. Okay? All right, so other than Justin, anybody else not know their name? Okay, so that's where you put your name, where it says my name. And then here's where your commitment come in, comes in tonight. And my challenge to you tonight is, don't walk away from this place and just say, well, I didn't like that sermon. I don't really care if you like it. <laughs> All right. What I want is to motivate you to live out the great mission of Jesus. Right? So if you're willing to do that, then make a commitment tonight. In your heart, say, Lord, I am committed to doing something about this. I refuse to be disobedient to your great mission anymore. And commit yourself to pray for seven people for seven weeks leading up to Resurrection Sunday, starting tonight. Okay? That's doable, isn't it? Is this something anybody in this room can't do? Pray and ask God, lead me to seven people. And we're going to, as we close in prayer in just a little bit, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask God to guide you and lead you and to speak into your hearts the names of seven people or seven families that he wants you to pray for. Each and every one of us are going to come up with a different list of people tonight. But think about what would happen. Okay, we want 3,000 new souls, right? Yeah, right? Think about what would happen if every person here tonight commits to pray for seven people or seven families. And then that's not where you're done with prayer. You'll notice on the back, the strategy is called prayer, care, share. It's a simple tool, a simple strategy about how to go from no disciples to multitudes of disciples, how you can go from having no people you've led to faith in Christ to having 30 or 60 or 100 people that you've led to faith in Christ. So first of all, you're going to pray. That's the prayer part. And then you're going to care, right? It gives a little description on the back side of this paper, and you can read that on your own. The idea of care is to find creative ways to serve people that you're praying for with simple acts of kindness demonstrates God's love in practical, tangible ways. So the list of people that's on your list, you pray for them, but you look for an opportunity to care for them in some practical way. Well, why would I want to do something like that? Well, that's where the last part comes in. That's the share part, right? Prayer, care, share. The last part is share, because as you pray for people, who's going to be working on their heart? God's going to be working on your heart, but then as you care for them, it gives you an opportunity to get involved in their lives, and as you get involved in their lives, then we get to the share part, and we just say to people, by the way, do you know Jesus? I'd love to tell you about Jesus. Can we take a few minutes just to talk about what Jesus has done in my life? 
And there's a little strategy there, right? You share three different stories. You share their story and your own Jesus story and then the gospel story. So you get talking to people. You know what people like to talk about themselves? Mm -hmm. Right? Just ask them about their lives. Yeah. So tell me about your life. If you stop and listen, you will find people that would love to tell you about their lives. Because everybody wants to talk about themselves. Mm -hmm. Right? So just listen to their story. And then as they're telling their story, you just, you're being in prayer. And then in prayer, you just look for an opportunity. Then you share your story about how you came to faith in Christ. And then you say, and by the way, my story can be your story as well. Amen. Do you know the gospel story? Do you know the Jesus story? And then you memorize scriptures, right? The gospel story, I have it on the bottom. Memorize key scriptures to show a person how they can begin a faith relation with Jesus for themselves. And by the way, your pastor can show you these if you need help. Okay, pastors, help them out if somebody asks you for help. On the bottom is a website there, Love 2020, with tons of other resources that can help a person out uh, to find, uh, help you out how to go about doing this philosophy of prayer and care and share. So tonight, brothers and sisters, are you ready to make a commitment? To repent of our great disobedience to the great command and recommit ourselves to boldly share the faith of Jesus with as many people as we can so that by the end of our lives we can be considered fruitful disciples who have harvested a crop of 30 or 60 or 100 times our own life. Let's pray together in closing. Father in heaven, I thank you tonight for this great mission of Jesus. Father, we want to be disciples who obey everything that Jesus commanded, especially his command to make disciples. Father, we recognize that in the church in America, we have been distracted by so many things. So many thorns, entertainment and pursuit of money and all kinds of stuff. But Father, we just ask you to forgive us of this great disobedience to your great command. And tonight, Father, we want to recommit ourselves to make disciples, to do whatever it takes, Father, to be fruitful Christians so that as we go out with our lifeboat, there will be none that are left behind. Father, I pray that we would turn our lifeboats around so that we might reach the lost, so that they might also be saved. Right now, as we're in prayer, I would ask, ask you to just, in your own heart, just ask God to speak into your heart right now the names of seven people or seven families that he would have you to be praying for. And just listen to what God is going to be saying to you. He might reveal it, these names to you right away. Or he might uh, reveal them to you over the next several days. But Father, tonight, we are here tonight to say that we are ready to commit ourselves to pray for these people that you lead us to. And Father, we will be faithful to pray for those people for the next seven weeks when we celebrate this awesome truth of the resurrection. And Father, we don't want to just celebrate the resurrection for ourselves, but we want to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the lives of new people that are coming, going to come to faith in Christ because we are going to have an opportunity to share about who Jesus is with them. Father, I pray that many, many people, new people, will come to faith in Christ because we were willing to pray and care and share the good news of the gospel. Father, do that good work in us, and we thank you for this great mission that you give us the privilege to be a part of. And we thank you for your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross so that we might have this message of salvation to take to the world and to receive for ourselves. Thank you, Father, for all that good work. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Be challenged. Those Methodist preachers can really preach, can't they? Nah. Man. <laughs>